This is The Blockchain Show. The Blockchain Show is a podcast that demystifies and promotes widespread adoption of cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technology. This is episode number 36. We have a very special guest today at the end of the show, Austin Father E. Coming up, Sarah and Steve. Today's episode of The Blockchain Show is sponsored by Coinigy. Coinigy is an advanced Bitcoin, altcoin, and cryptocurrency day trading platform compatible with every major cryptocurrency exchange. Manage all of your exchange accounts under one simple interface while taking advantage of Coinigy's full-featured analytics and trade execution tools for cryptocurrency trading. Learn more at Coinigy.com. Are you looking for an easy way to buy Bitcoin or Ether on a safe, secure platform? Coinbase is the easiest place to buy and sell digital currencies. Sign up today as a friend of the Blockchain Show, and if you buy or sell $100 of Bitcoin or more, you'll earn $10 of free Bitcoin for yourself and $10 of Bitcoin to support this show. Join now using the link in this episode's show notes at theblockchainshow.com. I did some weird stuff in preparation for the show. Um, did you hear about George Nuri, though? I don't even know who George Nuri is, really. You keep you talked about him a few times, and I know you want to get him on the show. Yeah. But, like, I, I don't know who he is. I have no idea. Um, he's So he's just, like, a really interesting dude who has, like, no fear of of just asking questions no matter how weird it sounds. I, lo- I love that about him. He is not threatened by new information. He's, uh, and I'm sure he's okay with me saying this, he's a slightly older gentleman. You know, he's lived a full, wonderful life. And that's what I think is really interesting 66. about him. He has a very... Oh, wonderful. What's that? He's not full. He's 66. Is he 66? Yeah. Anyway, he looks full, good and I love him. But uh, what I like <laughs> about it is that he's 66. Wait, you know, you don't know anything about him, but you know his age? I knew how to Google. I didn't Google him. <laughs> George Nuri, N O O R Y, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. He's 66. Okay, well, thanks. I know he's a Gemini because <laughs> I gave him a birthday present. I saw him. That's how Wait, fast you, you, wishes you saw come him? true. Yes. What? I met him. And not only that, I <laughs> hugged him. I embraced him. I shed a tear with him. <laughs> oh, it's great. See, so is he coming me. on the show then? I think he seems like he would be willing to do it. Definitely, he seems like. I, I must say that when I saw him, he was, um, well, he was always he was wonderful. I mean, like I really did get to. I didn't want to take a picture with him because I dislike pictures, but somehow or the other, got like, like herded into a picture, and then it just kept getting bigger. And I don't, I don't want to see those pictures. I don't know where they're even going to be. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it was fun. He kept talking about my height, of course, as does everybody on Earth. Yeah. But he seemed a little uh, distracted. That's just my he, but I, which I can imagine. It must be very peculiar to have like a room full of people there just to see you. Um, well, where was this at? It was at a Greek restaurant in Sherman Oaks, and like the the gods were very kind to me that day because he just <laughs> happened to. I guess it, he used to have a radio show on a, in a studio right up the street, and this is the this Greek joint is where he used to go for lunch all the time. He obviously knew these guys it's just like a really sort of typical little greasy spoon there a little greek place and it happens to be right by the psychic guy bookshop so that was a bonus which yeah. leads me to my next thing i mean i yes i did i got to talk to him it was really wonderful and he was so nice and that's awesome yeah but i also couldn't help but think because i've been learning so many things and oh man there was so many fun people at that at that lunch but <clears throat> that's neither here nor there I did a weird thing huh. that I, I'm sure you're going to – you you are – I would like to give you some credit here. I need credit where credit is due, Steve. You really also listen to me with a great deal of patience. It takes a lot of patience to, A, listen to me, period. But uh-huh. B, listen um, without <laughs> – without, um, I know that I challenge a lot of people, and I think you do a really good job of keeping it fun, and I'm grateful to you for that. So here's the weird, slightly strange thing I've done. I didn't even really think about it this way, but you can actually, because you know how when you do a chart, like you say, oh, I'm a, I'm a Pisces, 
I'm a Pisces. Yes. Right. So mm-hmm. you can actually still like, you know, it, it's just a snapshot of the energy hitting the earth at that moment. So you could literally do Bitcoin's chart, which people have probably done. But I thought mm-hmm. I'd like sure. to see what Bitcoin's chart looks like. And it is interesting. I'm going to I'm going to actually put this picture up of 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 what the chart looks like because the chart alone to me is interesting. It's just huh. the shape of it is something that stands out. Normally when you look at a chart it kind of looks like a mo- most of them just sort of look like a like a spider a, a messed up not spider's web but just like Jiggy, jaggedy lines without much of a pattern. But this actually kind of appears to have a beautiful pattern in it. And wow. Yeah, it's really quite special, I think. And since, it, am I right in saying that we could say that Bitcoin's birthday really was October 31st, 2008, right? Ah, uh, well... That's what I, when I looked it up, that was what I saw. That was the date that it was published. Sounds like, I thought it would be... Maybe. I could be wrong. Right. Right. This could be the chart for something else that happened that day, but uh, this is what I got. Anyway, that's what the Googles say. And if you're trusting George Nurse's that age to uh, that, we can also trust Bitcoin's age. Bitcoin, that's when the paper was published? Okay. Yeah, I see, August. Somewhere on the interwebs. Domain name Bitcoin org registered. October 31st, Bitcoin design paper published. Right. November 9th, Bitcoin project registered. January 3rd, Genesis block. So I'm going to say yeah. born. I mean, that's, there's a lot of dates there. Yeah. I'm, I Didn't we even had a guest both... who, had a, who had a baby born on that day? I remember, because that was right after Wolfie was born. Yeah. Coincidence? I would probably I pick not. January 3rd at 18.15.05 GMT. Wait, January 3rd? What's this about? That's the Genesis block. What is? Oh, is that a different thing? Yeah, so there was a paper that was published on October 31st, and that was the white paper. I hope it was the white paper. If it was the white paper, that would make a look. It wasn't the... Yeah, so the white paper was published. So the white paper is Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer electronic cash system. And almost everybody ignored it, right? He posted it to a uh, cypherpunk or a... You know, an old mailing list, a cryptography mailing list. That's what it was. Um, and nobody took him seriously. Nobody thought it would work. Or uh, nobody apparently, you know, noticed it at all and kind of thought he was uh, or thought they were not with it. And so <laughs> he decided to, you know, kind of build a reference client, you know, um, build it all. And so the actual first... Um, block. So the the software started running January third. But I don't know. Do you go with when the paper was published? Do you go when? What, I mean, what do you call like the day? What? Why did you pick October thirty first out of any other dates? Because that was like the first. Bam! That was the first thing that was ever published about it. And so to me, that looked like Bitcoin's birthday. <clears throat> okay. No, I mean it's it's it's. I don't know if I would, if I were to have to choose beforehand, if I would choose January 3rd or the paper. But the paper was the 31st, right? October 31st. What about like when, you know, Satoshi like decided to do it, decided to make it, you know, decided to be like, oh, that might be something like uh, the conception. (laughs) And then, and then the gestation is when it's, (laughs) it's all forming in Satoshi's world and, coming out of his little cookie clack fingertips and then born on October 31st 2008 at any rate that's the chart I got going and it's a beautiful one so right. but that that does make and I know you're going to appreciate this Steve that does make Bitcoin a Scorpio oh did you did you, did you hear about Mark Zuckerberg and his uh, call for a universal basic income Oh, I did actually. Yeah. What a weird and unlikely source. Right? Huh. Well, why do you think that is? Why do you think he uh, jumped on the bandwagon? I don't know. I don't I know so little about him. I guess I saw that movie about him, but I don't. Right. I don't really remember it. But that is curious. I was just thinking about that. What a, that is an unlikely place for it to come, but I guess I don't know him that well. Huh. 
I, I, I really think that's got to happen. I, I don't know what's the hold up. Like, who doesn't want that? I guess there's a small group of people who don't want that. Yeah. But, I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of people who don't understand it. Um, if you asked, you know, 100 Americans, how many of them do you think would actually even know what UBI meant? I don't know. That sounds more like a urinary tract infection. Well, you know, respect to, you know, I don't, I think UBI, you mean my urinary infection? <laughs> I just take, you know. Why are we talking about but this? You, yeah, no, I, I, I don't think that there's a huge number of people who even know about it, let alone understand it. I mean, there really is like a cost that society pays for criminal behavior and for, you know, not for criminal behavior, even a little bit of that is would be rec- would be uh, solved with this. But, you know, all the social services, a lot of it gets eaten up in bureaucracy. Yeah. So oh, yeah. You, say, you, you would save money by doing a UBI. Like it would cost less. I'm sure. Yeah. And uh, and that sounds. And like what does it matter anyway? They're just printing. <laughs> Doesn't it mean it's, like yeah. well, it's no skin off their back. Uh, are you excited for your uh, massive, massive amount of Ethereum that you have? Oh my gosh! Oh my god! It was like it was like I prayed for something and it came true. So there you go with your experience. Because thank you out there in the world, whoever did that. There's been how many yeah. people? We get a five dollar donation from uh, Nelson Waitan. Nelson, a long time ago, a long time ago, remember? Yes. Oh, yeah, and that one. Yeah, you now it's like <laughs> the Ethereum. It was a five dollar donation split four ways, and now your you know dollar twenty five is worth forty. Right? Oh my gosh! You know yeah, last time I looked, it was like thirty six. But wow. Yeah, it might have gone down a little bit. Wow. Isn't that crazy. Wow, that's so awesome. I had a friend that like. We were we went out disc golfing uh, maybe half a year ago or so, and um, we went out for drinks afterwards. I didn't have any money on me, and the ATM didn't work, and it didn't take Bitcoin. So I like I'll buy the next round, uh, but I'll have to pay you in Bitcoin. And the guy's like, sure. And so I like sent him thirteen bucks in Bitcoin. Uh. And then like two weeks ago, he he like texted me and like. So that Bitcoin is now worth, you know, a lot of fucking money. I oh, wish it's open. awesome. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> oh, that is so satisfying and awesome. Yeah, it's really funny. Super cool. And now for something completely different. This is an excerpt from Austin Fathery's Immortality Project. Once in a system where our future successes depends on the success of those that we have contributed to in the past, and when those that have contributed to us depend on our continued success, a dynamic thing will happen. Our deaths will be the worst thing that can happen to those that depend on us. This dependence of continued existence will drive medical research to a level where the life expectancy begins to increase at greater than a slope of one. This is the beginning of immortality. I'm Steve Anderson. I am host of The Blockchain Show, and I'm very happy to have our guest on the show. Uh, Austin, if you could introduce yourself a little bit for our... our... Sure. Uh, So my name is Austin Fothery. I live in Houston, and uh, I have a consulting company where I do all sorts of web application development, mobile application development stuff, um, and sort of have had as a hobby um, this this idea of, of... really coming up with a new kind of economics, which is kind of a big task to do. But um, I've been thinking about it a lot for the last 10 years or so mm-hmm. and have put together this system and published this new book uh, that is in the space. And, and now I'm trying to take that these concepts and apply them to the blockchain. I'm actually trying to build this thing out on Ethereum right now and trying to do that kind of in a public way and get as much feedback as I can, both on the sort of economic philosophy side as well as help on the actual technical implementation side as well. And so I'm just happy to finally have this stuff out there and out of my head and and start talking about it with people. So you've got a book. I, I, I see that it's available. You can like uh, get a read-only copy from GitHub. You can also... 
it's part of Kindle Unlimited, or you can buy a copy with Kindle for like twenty. I'm sorry, for Amazon for like twenty four bucks, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. The physical the- copy is twenty five dollars, and then the Kindle copy is nine bucks, and then you can read it for free on the web if you'd like. So it's called Immortality: Economic and Moral Framework Toward Immortality. What 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 does that mean? So the book is really broken into into three pieces. Um, the first third is is kind of moral philosophy, um, which is uh, probably not a thing that's usually discussed around blockchain, but um, it, it it came out of me trying to launch this thing two years ago and um, people asking me why in the world I would want to do something like this. Um, and I got I got distracted because a friend of mine and I bought another company and we've been running that for the last two years. And as I've been on airplanes crisscrossing the country, I've been trying to ask the question and and answer the question myself as to why I want to do something like this. Why do you want to do something like this? (laughs) (laughs) uh, I want to do something like this because I think it's good and right to do so. Uh, The the moral philosophy stuff kind of flows out of um, a a couple different uh, authors that have been very influential to me, uh, Christopher Alexander who's an architect who came up with the idea of pattern languages. Um, Robert Persig, who unfortunately just passed away. Uh, his book is in, in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and its follow-up, Leela. Uh, a little bit of Nassim Taleb, who is uh, author of The Black Swan, um, as well as uh, David Deutsch and, and some others. Uh, and so I've, I've kind of just sort of synthesized all of their stuff into why I think that we need to come up with a new kind of economics uh, for you know, the next sort of phase of, of humanity and why I think it's really important uh, as we move towards things like longer lifespans, um, you know, increased automation, artificial intelligence, things like that. Um, s- some things are going to have to change. And, um, and so I, I sort of put down in that first third of the book why I think it's important for things to change. And um, the ultimate answer is, is I think that, um, <laughs> and, and this is out there, uh, but uh, you know, there's a lot of existential risk with artificial intelligence. And um, we kind of need to prove uh, to future artificial intelligences that we're worth keeping around. And um, that's a hard thing to do. Um, but, but what I find in the blockchain, what I find most interesting is this ability to record uh, what has actually happened in a way that can't be changed and that is verifiable. And so I, I talk I talk a lot about that and how I think that's going to be really important to, um, you know, future societies who look back and say, hey, what did and didn't work? Um, and to actually have this piece of information that's verifiable is is pretty cool. Yeah, we, we talk about that a lot on the show is, you know, with the advent of blockchain, it's really the first time in history that there's been unalterable um, statements being made or, or transactions or, or, you know, th- there's no way to alter what transpired at a certain time. There's a time stamp. It says this happened at this time and there's no way for anybody. I mean, in all practical purposes, there's no way for anybody to, to, to change it at all. And that's not been the case. Um, you know, history has been rewritten by the winners, you know, all the time. And, you know, sometimes what has or hasn't happened, you know, if you played the uh, telephone game when you were a child, it, it changes from person to person what actually happened. The history isn't, uh, until blockchain, it hasn't been, you know, like set in stone, set in blockchain. And and that that's kind of one of the, the principles of your book is having this unalterable history. Um, and you mentioned that there's uh, a few things that make... Uh, the, the current landscape uh, change automation you know a lot of people may be out of work with the way things are going um, so what are the what are the f- the big issues you mentioned AI uh, as an existential risk I mean there's other existential risks as well um, you know just the, the 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 ability for one person to do so much damage maybe existential right. risk of um, you know global warming. Uh, we, you know, we have a lot of different things that, um, you know, are just coming to a head with, with, uh, you know, technological singularity, if you want to borrow a phrase from 
Kurzweil is, yeah, is Kurzweil. I think, <laughs> kind of can, but. Right. Yeah. So, so what I what I go into the book is, you know, we don't know what that thing's going to be. You know, we can look at what is and make some assumptions about how those things came to be. And um, if, if you think of you know, so economics, traditional economics is sort of this supply and demand of resources. Um, but, but the ultimate sort of equations and science behind that is that there's this there, there's this thing that's supplied and this thing that's demanded, and then you have this equilibrium that forms. And and so what I do is I kind of borrow some stuff from Robert Persig and, and sort of look at the world and say, look, there are these four really main economies that we have um, in our world. We've got we've got the inorganic. Uh, economy, which is an economy of forces. There are forces and energy supplied and forces and energy demanded. And our world sort of falls out of that equilibrium um, of those forces. Uh, then you have uh, the organic, I'm sorry, which the is... Inorganic, that's just like energy and magnetism and stuff like yep. that? or Yep. Uh, okay. Molecules, atoms, things like that. Uh, and that's sort of this base level. Okay. Uh, then you have the organic, which was built on top of that. Right, so carbon is sort of this magical element that bootstraps an entirely new economy, and this new economy is one that's built on top of fitness. And you know, we see Charles Darwin, um, you know, sort of pointed this out, and we've we've elaborated on the ideal, but we now understand this idea of fitness um, built on this organic platform that uh, there's a survival of the fittest. And, and what's interesting. Uh, I call it a bootstrap. Um, the organic, some of the purpose of the organic economy is to subdue the physical economy. And so you take, you're basically fighting entropy. So much of life and, and biology is fighting the sort of inherent entropy around us. So that's the second economy. The third one is, is a resource economy. Uh, that's our society that was built, you know, uh, we, we moved past fitness at some point and said, hey, if we collect enough of these resources and have them available, we can, we can outrun fitness. Um, that's the third economy. And then the fourth one is, is this economy of science and intellect, where we first sort of really see this vector of time being used, where we can say, hey, if we do X, Y, and Z in controlled environment, A, B, C, we always know that one, two, three is going to happen. Right? And that's actually a new thing that was not like inherent in the world until the neocortex, uh, at least in our little area of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've got those four economies. And, and what I think is cool is that um, each one bootstraps and it subdues the one below it. And, and, it um, and, and what the book says is we don't know where the next one's going to come from. But we know it's going to come. Um, and so it could branch off from the physical again. And so I talk about uh, things like gray goose scenarios and um, uh, new types of, of, of alternate biologies. Um, the, you know, we could evolve again in a different way, which I don't think is very likely given our society unless we start traveling to different planets and get separated. And that, that kind of takes off um, – and a lot of these are very far future things. Um, right. Uh, th and then there's, you know, our society bootstrapping, which is where I ultimately focus. Um, because I think if intelligence bootstraps first, we're going to have a real problem because we have not ver been very good stewards of, um, uh, of what we have. And we don't have a verifiable way to show that we have been good stewards of what we have. So... Is there, um, is that, there, that's where the blockchain comes in. It says, hey, look, we, you know, we built this system. We understood the way resources work, and we built this system on top of it that uh, is anti-fragile and redistributes itself in the face of volatility. Um, and that's the middle third of the book where I actually propose a system for realigning our incentives uh, in our resource-based economy so that we we can roll with the punches much better than we do today. Could you kind of uh, outline uh, your, your solution for us? Um, sure. sure. So um, we, we sort of treat the blockchain as a time machine. Um, 
because we have the blockchain, we can make a decision. Unfortunately, we can't go forward in time. But with the blockchain, we can go backwards in time and, and look at the way an economy flowed and make decisions based on real data and reward uh, those who actually made a verifiable impact. Mm -hmm. So our current economy, uh, a lot of decisions are made without time as a vector. It's, I have this much money, I want to get this resource what you know? What's the equilibrium right now? Sort of without regard to what I'm going to have to give up to get it, without regard uh, to what that could have bought for me in the future. Um, most of our decisions are made in a very, you know, t non-time based system. Hey, I want this bottle of wine. It's twenty bucks. I've got twenty bucks. I'm going to buy. I'm going to buy the bottle of wine, mm -hmm. um, and I've got it. Um, and that's it. The transaction's over. Um, but that doesn't have to be it. Uh, and so what the system does is it adds um, it adds a system of uh, future-based rewards based on how you spend your money. So if I buy a, that $20 bottle of wine, what happens is I get $20 worth of points in that account that received the $20. And uh, we employ a kind of money that's... Uh, that's called natural money, which means that the money decays over time. So if that person just holds on to the $20 forever and ever and never spends it, eventually that money will decay away at some agreed upon rate. Mm -hmm. What's cool about the blockchain is instead of that money just decaying into either nothing or decaying as a tax to the government or decaying as a reward to miners, we can let it decay and flow backwards to the blockchain to the people who have paid money into an account. Um, and what this does is it gives you a new incentive to spend your money with people that you think will be successful in the future in providing value in the future. So my hope is that I spend $20 on your wine and you're able to take that $20 and you know, turn it into a wine company where you end up having millions of dollars flow through your account, some of which will decay back to me. Uh, if I choose wisely, more of it's going to, going to decay back to me than would if I, if I spent foolishly uh, on someone who is going to waste the money on, on consumption or, or something along those lines. No, Now, there's a certain amount of that in the current economy that if you, you know, support your local businesses, you think they're more likely to um, spend that money in their local economy, will eventually feed back to you. But Amazon is just so nice to get, they have everything. You can buy everything. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and here's – that's a perfect example is Amazon. Ultimately – it's incredibly efficient. Amazon is an incredibly efficient vehicle for, for delivery, and they're building an incredible system. And so we have to ask is um, it does kill the local businesses. Um, so do we want to keep it around or not? And, and I, don't know, I don't know the answer to that question, um, but this system aligns you more along the lines of, hey, if we um, – if we do pick Amazon and we're all going to be spending billions of dollars with Amazon a year, mm -hmm. at least Amazon is responsible for spending that money um, appropriately and in a positive way. Um, and if they don't, if they don't continue to be relevant, then, um, then, it's, th then it'll, you know, people will make a different choice. Um, and, and in a, one of the things I propose is this sort of idea of corporate death um, and, uh, and not, not like let's go kill all the corporations, but in the sense that I think it's a real problem that our, the way our corporations work is that they're deathless. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the original corporations weren't. Original corporations back in the 15 and 1600s had like 20-year caps on them and they were to reduce risk. Hmm. Um, and we've gotten away from that. I mean you, you don't need limited liability – to sell bottles of water. Um, this is not an inherently risky thing that you should be protected. You have all these incredible corporate protections. And so, um, uh, yeah, if you're going to, if you're going to try to put somebody on Mars, let's, let's give you limited liability because the ultimate upside of that is huge for humanity. 
Um, but, but what happens in the system is as you pay more and more money into account, the amount of benefit you get for paying into an account that already has given out billions of dollars in, in, this, uh, in, in these PREF points uh, is, is there's a, a rate of um, uh, a reduction in return as time goes on. And so an upstart has much more of an ability to be innovative and say, hey, I'm a new account. You have more to gain from me. Uh, than you do from continuing to spend with Amazon, um, and and I th- I think that's a that's a nice counterweight to these these giant corporations, and it, and it what it does is it establishes a life cycle. Um, you know you have this infant period where your you know, your people are very excited about you, they're more willing to spend their money with you because you are new. Uh, then you have sort of the adult life of a corporation where you're maintaining this this level of integrity. You're trying to be a, a profitable corporation. Eventually, you get older, and it's just not, it's not a sustainable thing. And so you probably have your established customers who are going to continue along with you, but eventually, you're, uh, unless you are just exponentially profitable uh, over time, you're gonna, uh, your attractiveness as, a, as an entity to spend money with is going to decline. And, and I think that's just an interesting way to balance out this, this sort of giant corporatism that we have going on right now. Interesting. So how does the pref points flow back to you? So if you get pref points for the bottle of wine, you have 20 pref points or whatever. I'm, I'm, could you fill me in a little bit how the how does that ben, does that benefit me only? Do do I get actual, you know, quote unquote dollars to spend uh if the wine company does well or Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So so you spend um Let's let's do a thought exercise. Um, if if I spend twenty dollars with you, uh, and so I have twenty dollars in your account, and then you suddenly inherit ten million dollars, mm-hmm. and I'm the only other person who's ever spent money with you uh, into your account, uh, all of a sudden I have a huge gain about to come my way because as your money decays, let's say it decays over ten percent, you've got a million dollars in your account. Ten uh, percent of that's a uh, hundred thousand dollars. So over the course of a year, I would get $100,000 in benefits hmm. flowing back to me. Now, that's, that's not a, that is not a normal situation, right? but that, that's one extreme. The other extreme would be uh, you're a company, and I've paid you $20. I get a very small share. Everybody who's get, given you money gets a very small share, but you are successful, and you grow your business at 20% a year, and you go from, from getting a million dollars in revenue um, a year to – uh, 10 million over 10 years. Well, the pieces are probably going to be very small, but as I spend my money throughout the economy in this way, those small pieces are going to add up. Um, and, uh, and, and eventually what this leads to is a form of what I call earned universal basic income, mm-hmm. um, where over time, as you participate in the economy, you begin to develop a basic income uh, from the from this cash flowing back to you. It's not it's not a default. You don't just get it. You have to you have to be wise. You have to spend uh, uh, you know, spend in a certain way. But over time, you establish enough credibility to the economy that says, "Hey, I'm a person who you know uh, uh, will spend this money wisely." Why did you and choose? So, why did you choose an earned uh, universal base? Are you Earned basic income over universal basic income. Well, so the universal basic income—it's uh, it, hard to decide how to start that or where to start that. Um, and so, if you just say, "Hey, I'm going to give everybody twenty thousand dollars a year," I, I'm not opposed to that. Uh-huh. I think it's—I think it—I think it could be a good thing. Uh, as someone who's wanted to start companies and not had the resources, who has a family and you know has certain restrictions that I can't. There's certain things I can't go do because I have kids, yeah. and you know, I think. Uh, there's a lot of things that I've wanted to do but haven't had the resources to do, and a universal basic income uh, would solve a lot of those problems. But there are there are unanswered questions about the effects of an of a universal income mm-hmm. that that we haven't answered, and I think this answers some of them, which is that um, you do have to participate in this economy for a long time before you probably have enough coming in that you could say, hey, I'm going to take three years off and try to start something new. Mm-hmm. Um, 
uh, and the amount that you you bring in is uh, is tied to your responsibility and how you spend the money. So if um, if you if you get twenty years down the road and decide you're going to take some time off, but that you spend the money on you spend it poorly with companies that are not going to do well, that are not going to be delivering value, that money is going to then descend down and, and become small again over time. Uh, so there's kind of a regulator on how much of a, um, uh, of a free ride you can get. Um, w- with the amount of automation we have going on and the amount of resources we have available to us, you know, we're not there yet, but we are getting to a point where we can produce enough for everybody without everybody having to work full time, right? I mean, right. and that's only going to get bigger. And so, giving people free rides is going to be an integral part of a future economy. It's just going to be a matter of how is that regulated and how is that scored. And so, I've tried to come up with a way that um, still has economic drivers behind it uh, that, that will you know, be sort of self-regulating. So you kind of start off with uh, earned basic income, and then you know once some of the questions are answered of how that works, you could maybe at some point in the future switch it over to a, a universal. So you're not opposed to a universal. You just don't see how it would start or how to get it going. Yeah, and, and with the other, the other way that this comes in with a universal basic income is on the welfare side, and I talk about this some in the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, the great thing about a decaying currency is if you have something crazy like a giant stock market crash, like a Great Depression, if your currency decays, you can just print a bunch of it right, and up the decay rate and be like, hey, for the next five years, we're just going to print enough money for people to buy all the stuff that's being produced, but we're going to increase the decay rate to 25%. So that, and, you know, this is a function, and you can graph this function. You can tell, based on the decay rate, how fast that money then decays back out of the economy. Who would be in charge of setting that rate or determining whether it's a time to uh, influx uh, the amount of currency that's available? Yep, that's and that's the third part of the book. So there's there's three third uh, uh, three thirds. The first is the moral philo- philosophy. The middle is the actual implementation of how you build a thing on blockchain. Mm-hmm. The third is if this thing can't self emerge, how would we implement a political system to run this thing in in a uh, in a responsible way? Um, and it, it actually uses the current U.S. Constitution as a basis. Um, keeps probably about. 85% of it and then add some things on top of it that, that I think are uh, checks and balances that we are going, you know, additional checks and balances that we're going to need in the future. Yeah. Um, and so uh, what, what you have here is you have a system of um, citizen accounts, which um, uh, keep, keep track of this. Hey, here's how much money I have. Here's who I've paid to. Here's who's paid to me. Um, and, and each of those accounts gets a vote to the issuing authority, and there is an issuing authority that can create a government structure underneath it. And I have a, a concept in this which is called a citizen veto, where any, any entity that you pay taxes to, you can vote to suspend their access to their cash. Um, so they have government accounts, and if you pay a tax to that government account, you get to vote on whether or not they can use your money or not. And so um, basically what happens is um, – uh, and why I think the system has has the ability to be really successful is that sort of the killer app uh, in this economy is that it makes taxation really, really easy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I can I can see governments um, in particular being inclined to implement a system like this because it allows them to collect revenue really easily. But at the same time, it adds the check and balance of, hey, if you if we don't like the way your uh, uh, your governing, we have the ability to suspend your account and you no longer have access to these funds until you sort of give in to the demands uh, of of the public. What a, and so that's kind of, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, that's kind of how that works. I wanted to jump back maybe a little bit and talk about sure. privacy. It seems like one of the, there's a big issue if you're, you know, getting all your money from these, uh, pref point kickbacks, you know, now all of your purchases are, are, 
everything you do is basically made available. Anybody can look at it. Um, you know, the, the blockchain isn't really encrypted. Uh, so how do you how do you balance the the want to do all these sort of uh, to to reward people who do good in the economy with with their right to remain private? How, how do you is there a way to like uh, take the information about what your what pre- what preferences you have in the economy? private so not everybody can see and then you know uh maybe uh you know keep that from the regulators as well um so technically uh you know technically that's a challenge so i address it specifically in the book uh, by splitting the economy into citizen accounts legal entity accounts and government accounts i I try to create more positives than negatives uh when it comes to the reduction in privacy Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I say, I, I say when I'm asked this question is, well, you know, do you own any stocks? Uh, and generally people say yes, or I own 401k. And, 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 and then the next question is, do you own any of those stocks anonymously? Um, and the answer is usually no. And I say, why? And they say, well, I want the dividends. I want the rights that those, that those things entail. And so in one sense, this is a less private system. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other sense, there's a reason for it. You want to own the stock and this cash that's flowing back to the economy. And so it, it's really it's, – it's an interesting question to uh, – uh, and, and a conversation to have because I don't know the answer to it. Mm. The answer may be absolutely no way would I ever want people to know that I bought my milk from Kroger down the street, right? Yeah. Um, uh, on the other hand, there are real re- real things that you want privacy for. What if it was your raw milk, you know, and it's illegal to buy raw milk? Well, that's that's possible. Or if it's <laughs> something health related, you may want uh, you may want privacy. So the way this is divided up is that there are citizens' accounts who have the ability to use what are called privacy pools, and I think this has sort of already been shown out in blockchain how you can do some of this stuff anonymously mm-hmm. uh, using ring. Uh, I think they're called token rings or things like that. So we allow these citizen accounts to still use private payments if they want, um, but. If you do that, you lose some of the some of the um, direct benefit because you're kind of getting thrown into a pool that's a much much broader pool. So you don't have as much say over the direct benefit that you get. You'll still get a benefit; it just be might be more um, uh, more distributed. Hmm. Um, for legal entity accounts, we actually <laughs> I actually lay out because I think this is a huge issue that for legal entities um, who have been given uh, limited liability that they can receive private payments from citizens, but they cannot make private payments. So that uh, legal entities who citizens have given reduced liability have to be open and transparent. And then government accounts can do cannot do any sort of private payment. Hmm. So they they both have to their their payouts and their pay ins are completely transparent. Yeah, uh, and that's an anti-corruption uh, measure. I think it's kind um, of necessary, and even without blockchain, it's just something that should be right. done no matter what. Right, right. And so, um, you know, I, I don't. I'm trying to build mathematical models and computer models and things like like that right now to actually prove this stuff out and um, how much a pri- you know paying through a privacy pool versus uh, owning what you pay um, are. Uh, um, uh, you know, is an open issue. Yeah. But but my, my ultimate feeling about privacy is that, um, uh, and, and, and some of this is a fear, and if, we, if we're not proactive about it, I think it absolutely will happen. I don't think we're going to have any privacy in the future. Hmm. Um, and so if we're not proactive about maintaining that and giving us a way to, to maintain some of that, um, uh, and, if, uh, or, and or flip it on its head so that uh, openness and transparency becomes more attractive than the privacy that it that it would afford. Um, you know, it, it's it's going to be tough with with just the way information works. It's hard to maintain privacy. Yeah, I think some of these uh, identity management systems that are out there trying to it's a difficult issue because you want to be able to share your healthcare records with your doctor for while you're at the office, but you may want to, you know, retract that information as soon as you leave, you know. So but you wouldn't want to say share that with the entire world. So right. kind of what they're doing is you'll have like one main account 
um, you know, because it's just an address, you know, like a random 64 character string that you can create as many of them as you want, basically. Um, and so you'll have like one like uh, identity and then a bunch of sub identities. That's kind of like one solution where each sub identity would be, uh, you know, you could create one and you may want to have, you know, a public sub identity and then more private sub identities and then kind of, you know, one account that controls all the keys for that and release the information that you want to release. Um, is there any sort of thoughts of implementing something like that into the system or is it kind of like a, do, do we really need to make sure that each person's identity is their identity and they don't have multiple identities on, on the, on the, in the space? Well, it's, you know, there's, there's a spectrum of ways to implement this. Um, and so I, I don't know which is, which is best. Um, uh, but, and that's what I'm trying to figure out. Right. But, but there, there's certainly a spectrum where it's like, Hey, this is, this is intimately tied in with our governance and our government. And we need to know which account is which so that voting is not, you know, messed with. Uh, and then there's another, there's another side of the economy. You know, there's another section of this where it's like, look, we just need the basics of this to work so that we can go into a place that's either been, you know, ravaged by a war or just political upheaval or economic upheaval and implement a system like this that gets cash flowing faster um, and helps, you know, boot up an economy um, in a faster manner. And so I think, I think you may end up with a broad, um, uh, I haven't made any any uh, right. <laughs> real decisions along where that's going to actually fall out. Um, so, so I don't I don't know. Um, oh, absolutely, in the third part of the book, where I'm proposing this as sort of a replacement for you know, economic and gover- uh, economics and government, mm-hmm. that's a that's a pretty identifiable area where you have your account and um, at, it's ultimately underneath you know, this umbrella of rule of law so that, you know, there's cra- crazy things that can happen with crypto right now that are, that are, I think, real problems for crypto. Like, oh, you sent, a, you sent some money to a contract, you know, a smart contract. You shouldn't have done that. It's lost forever now. Or, you know, you, oh, I, you know, I had my USB key and I fell in the pool and now I lost all my Bitcoin. All right. So some of these are, some of these are things that, um, you know, a simple rule of law can can help alleviate, um, and and so that's a big issue of how do we integrate rule of law with with these new blockchain based systems and do it in a transparent manner that that is uh, you know is is um, uh, in, in your mind, uh, you know resistant to authoritarianism. <laughs> how, how, how does the rule of law prevent somebody from losing their Bitcoin by falling into the pool with a USB stick? Um, well, uh, you can't. So uh, say um, you, ha- you have broad ranges of opinions on this I, okay. uh, as, far as, as far as what money is. I am of the opinion that money is a tool that we use and that's all it is. Right, it, it, like we get to decide how it works. Mm-hmm. Right, it's it, um, and so if if you are a government and someone is swindled out of ten million dollars by some Ponzi scheme, and the money's like disappeared somewhere, mm-hmm. like is there really a reason that the government can't? You know, it's proven. It's been through court. We know that this was this was you know a you were swindled out of it. Why can't we just give that person their ten million dollars back? Like, is there a reason why? Um, and and that's just an interesting question. So, in in a, in a rule of law system, if somebody is subject to some kind of fraud, you can fix the fraud. Whereas in Bitcoin right now, uh, unless you're going to do a hard fork, you can't just give people their money back. And you you have a perfect example of this with Ethereum, right? They actually had to do a hard fork to fix a fraud, right? But it it was an exception and not a, not a rule. Yeah. That'll probably Uh, never happen again on Ethereum. Right. So it was very controversial. It, you know, had to have all these crazy things happen and people had to agree to it. And you can't have that as a regular occurrence. Right. And, and until you can, until you can assure um, you know, my grandmother that her savings is not going to be 
stolen in some way, it's going to be very hard to roll out one of these systems uh, you know, universally. And so if, if you can institute a form of rule of law that is, uh, that is available but an exception, um, you know, then you have much more of a chance of deploying this out to the general public. So they're like, oh, hey, you know, some, somebody, you know. And this is the other great thing about the blockchain. If, take, take for instance, um, if quantum computing cracks the code, <laughs> right, mm-hmm. we, at least ha- we at least have the state of the blockchain at the date the code was cracked. Yeah. And we can, we can, via rule of law, we could fix it. Um, we could reconstitute the system and have everybody sign on that this is the reconstituted system. Um, and there's quantum so, resistant algorithms too. So when it eventually sure, does get sure. cracked, and it, and it will, I don't know how soon it will be, but eventually it, it will. Um, I think so. You know, the current system uh, of what is it, CPEC or something? I forget what it is, but um, you know, the, the 256 hash um, will get cracked. And. You know, this- and that's that's just one of the known existential risks to the whole system, right? The problem is the is you know, the unknown unknowns, right? We don't know what else is an existential risk to these systems, and so um, having avenues to um, to self correct, um, I think, is going to be very important to the systems going mainstream. It's typically a lot of people in the space, uh, you know, kind of have brush that issue aside and uh, they actually enjoy the solution much more without any sort of governance um, of that type. The, you know, when it happened on Ethereum, a number of people, you know, a small minority of the Ethereum project decided to, you know, keep, uh, keep the original chain alive and, and not go with the one that was edited. Um, how does, is it something that we just need to kind of as a society come to terms with that, you know, you have to be kind of careful with your own money and make sure that you uh, maybe it's in a contract for a little while. You know, there's a smart contract that 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 allows for these type of fail safes. But if you ignore the fail safes, then you're kind of at your own risk. So, sure. you know, something something where if people wanted to, you know, maintain their own money they could but also provide people who you know like your grandmother or my grandmother who wants to be safe uh and and ensure you know their money exists in a sort of smart contract that you know they have willingly entered into and the alternative exists as well um is that a necessary is that a a possibility or not worth the effort my opinion on on stores of value are that um you can't store value reliably, right? You have you can probabilistically store value. Mm-hmm. Uh, gold is probabilistically a decent store of value. Um, U.S. currency is prob- probabilistically a good store of value, right. but um, it loses value uh, every year. It, 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 it fluctuates. It's volatile, right? And so volatility is um, it, it, it exists. And so I think you're always going to have that. You're always going to have different kinds of currency. Okay. Um, I don't think there's going to be one ring to rule them all, if you will. Right. Um, but, um, and, and I'm not, I'm not preaching that. Okay. Um, I, I think that there, there will be a, there will be brand, there will be uh, certain styles of currency that will end up winning. Uh, and I think that, I think this idea of this decaying currency has the ability to, to be a dominant, uh, a dominant solution. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you have all kind. People are willing to take all kinds of different risks for different rewards. You just need to know that you're taking a risk, right? Um, you know, if you put if you had put all of your all of your money into Bitcoin, um, you know, three years ago, um, good for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> you know, but um, it could have gone the other way, right? Right. Um, and and it could still go the other way tomorrow, right? Um, and and so you have to manage that risk. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I think I think you have I think you have multiple answers, and I also think there's I don't I think there can be two right answers. Uh, part of what I say is that you know I, I appreciate what a lot of the sort of crypto anarchists and completely trustless based people are coming. From. I understand where they're coming from. Right. The question is: Is that the answer 
for the next 50 years? Or is that the answer for 150 years down the road? Um, you, you know, I do not think we're about to throw off the nation state uh, in the next 15 years. Um, I don't think we're going to throw off the nation state in the next 50 years. 150 years, we may. I expect, you know, once we go, once we you know, go pl- interplanetary, uh, we may have just one sort of one sort of government here uh, on Earth. I mean, um, but so the, and we may not, we, and we may find a way to not need government, but we're not there yet. So the nation state, uh, I don't, I don't even know if it's still like the dominant force in economics versus like the. Uh, multinational corporation. I mean, we still have nation states, but it seems like multinational corporations are the ones really uh, setting up, you know, controlling the economics of everything. Do, am I, do you have an opinion on that? Or maybe I should just edit that question out. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, I think that there's, and that, that's, I mean, that's why I put, that's part, part of why I put the control for legal entities in there is I don't think that, I don't think that multinational corporations uh, who are completely unaccountable except to shareholders are um, – I, I don't think that's a healthy system at all. Um, it happens to be what we have right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you look at the U.S. government right now that as of May 18th is a bit in chaos, um, you know, with uh, everybody yelling at each other and, uh, you know, independent uh, uh, – uh, investigation starting up and all this stuff. So, um, and yet the world is still turning. I mean, the market's down a little bit, but people don't, are not yet so freaked out that we're not going to be, um, you know, that we're not going to have life ongoing tomorrow. Um, and and part of that is because we have all of these organizations that are independent of the government that are so strong and powerful. I mean, who who the president of the United States of is doesn't necessarily affect Amazon's ability to get your package to you in two days. Right. It could, uh, in certain in certain really poor uh, scenarios, it could get dicey for them. But but that's a long way off unless things get really crazy. And so th- there's value to having corporations, um, but but there's there's an upper limit. It's kind of a you know there's a long short position to have there, right? Like we want we want strong independent organizations that can uh, participate in commerce. Uh, with limited oversight, uh, but then then you know you need some sort of break in there to say, hey, you're too big. Uh, this has gotten too out of control. You have too much power. It's a very interesting system, and it sounds like you're looking uh, to get some people to help you. This is certainly not something that I don't think one man, unless you're Vitalik, could could do. Right. <laughs> yeah, even though he he had help, but uh, so how would somebody? you know learn more about this and uh, help out if if they wanted to, to to join up with you sure so we have our uh the website is cadillacs.com uh, c-a-t-a-l-l-a-x.com um, and we have a, a news site there where i'm posting my development blogs and things like that um uh at hyper cadillacs on twitter is our is our twitter handle we have a facebook page as well um, that's all linked from from the website. Um, just reach out. Um, I'm looking. The first step is feedback. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> speaking with actual economists who have degrees who can tell me, look, this idea is just completely ludicrous. Um, <laughs> here, you know, uh, uh, and then talking through the reasons why it's completely ludicrous, and then either it either it is something that can be fixed or it can't. Um, but I think it's a conversation worth having. And it's something that was not possible until we had the blockchain. And so uh, that's the one thing that sort of lets me uh, feel like I'm not crazy, is that um, certainly smarter people could have come up with this in the past and debunked it, except that the blockchain didn't exist. And so um, I think it's time to have the conversation. Um, I'm writing some Ethereum code. I'm trying to publish a little bit of it, get some good ideas. Um, I've had some discussions on Reddit already. Um, I'm trying to post those articles up there in the Ethereum uh, subreddit and just um, you know hash some of these ideas out and figure out the best way to do it. Um, so, so come join the conversation. And um, if you're a coder and want to actually write some code and have some time to do that, um, you know, to start a weekly call um, uh, or a weekly Reddit post where those things can be discussed. Um, and people can start contributing. 
Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, it's been interesting. People should definitely check out the book or and uh, go to the website and see if you can't uh, participate in the conversation. Um, certainly interesting stuff happening. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. This has been fun. The Blockchain Show is a team effort by Heather Sullivan, Steve Anderson, Ethan Kinderconnect, and Sarah Hempfling. You can find us at www.theblockchainshow.com. Steve has made a wonderful website there for you to peruse. Grateful to you all on the team. Happy to make this podcast. Today's Memorial Day. I'd like to take a second to remember all those who have died for our freedoms.